All right, folks. So from today, we're going to talk about software testing. Okay, so software testing obviously is a very important step in software development. So most of the time, while we're still in college, and we do not really put too much requirement on software testing. And a lot of students actually can understand software testing, can understand why we're doing that. And some of the software te testing techniques are not too difficult to use or understand. But then most of the time, while we're still in school, we somehow tend to um, underestimate the, the significance of software testing and the requirements most of the company will put on writing the software tests. So this lecture, I'm going to give you some kind of background on software testing, some of the most important approaches and concepts. And in the next session, I'm going to show you some of the concrete unit testing techniques using JUnit. So last time we were talking about the IJO software development approach. All right, so the big idea is that we want to break down the big development cycles into smaller cycles. Every cycle we focus on less features, but then we still want to do a complete development, including design, coding, and also testing. But most importantly, we want to deliver it, release it to the, soft, to, to the software, to the users. The goal of doing that is to get more feedback, get more frequent feedback so that we can make sure we're on the right track in terms of our development. We can make sure that the things we're delivering are the features the users want. So we move faster with idle development and the user can see more updates. And obviously user will prefer this approach because they can see um, the progress, they can then benefit new features sooner rather than later. And drawing this kind of idle development approach cycle is really simple. Um, but really, we want you to make sure that you, you, you see a challenge in this, this whole cycle. It is obviously pretty easy and straightforward to release things more frequently, release things early. And I just de develop one or two features and I'm done, I will give it to users. But there is really a challenge. While you're doing the frequent delivery like this, how can you still make sure your software is working as expected? Because in old old days when we followed the old, uh, waterfall, development model, and then we normally have a, a big chunk of time dedicated for testing. And we got a more plan and we can run more tests and then spend more time with it. But now we put the test into every single cycle. Maybe your feature is less, but you know how can you still uh, make sure you got the same kind of quality of testing? So that's really a challenge. All right, so it, that's why all the team today, um, especially when you, they are following idle development, they really put a very high requirement on software testing. Now here you need to understand the goal of software testing or program testing. It is not to um, prove that your software does not have errors. Because if you think about that, it's actually not possible. The software testing is to try to find the presence of errors as much as you can. All right, so this is one kind of a, a background you need to realize that you know, software testing is not easy and the proof is correct, it's, it's almost impossible. So we just need to do our best to show the errors as many as you can. So if you write a test and then you find out the errors and bugs, that's actually very successful testing. All right, so a, su a successful test discovers one or more errors. Now here is a higher level um, discussion about the, what the test is and then what is the ideal case of testing. So if you think about the whole software development, this big cycle here, circle here is uh, specification. So that's our required and specified behavior. Now this cycle here uh, is a, a system we programmed and then being implemented. And this circle is the system, the part of the system that's been uh, tested. So obviously we want to increase the area of number one because this one means that we have implemented the specified behavior and also we have tested. And then we don't want you to program a lot of things that's not specified. And also we do not want to have a lot of things that's not being covered by the test. And then there are different kind of uh, um, tests happen at different levels. Now let's go from the bottom level. So when coders and developers writing their modules, methods and classes, we need to perform a lot of detailed unit testing. That's where we're going to focus on. Once you build more classes and components together, you need to run some tests against all of them as a whole entity. So that's when you need integration test. And eventually, once you finish your whole system 
and then right before you deliver to user, you also need to perform some kind of system test that include not only the functional testing, but also non-functional testing. For example, I got this web page. How is the performance? How is the latency? Can I make sure that most of the users can open this page very quickly within you know, 500 milliseconds? And eventually we deliver to user and the user will perform the acceptance test. They want to make sure that the final software product is the thing they need to use. So these are different types of testing. At the developer, we're mostly focused on the first two. And also there are different kind of testing stages. And there's alpha testing that's mainly talking about the internal testing by developers. And this is the kind of a, the most important part right after you finish your code, you need to perform some kind of alpha testing. And then the beta testing, all of us have heard a lot about this. Basically, it means that we have the real user in the public to test it so that we can get more feedback in a larger scale. A few years ago, you know, nowadays you know, Gmail is a very mature product, but you know, I remember five, seven years ago after the Gmail had been in the market for many years. But at that time, if you look at Gmail's logo, there's still a beta uh, logo here. That means that they still consider Gmail as a experimental product that they're still constantly uh, receiving the feedback and you know, trying to learn from a user to see what to improve. That's called beta testing. And you know, if you look at the history of software testing, it really went through uh, different stages. You know, in the very beginning, there was, wasn't any testing because people were struggling of making things work and then testing just means debugging, just try to make things work. And later on, people realized that we need to perform a very formal testing and verification. So at that time, the goal of testing is to prove or to show that the software works without any issues. And later on, people realized that it's impossible to show software works perfect or there's no bugs, but uh, we can actually try our best to show there are errors and bugs. So at that stage, people realized that the main purpose of testing is to show errors rather than show the absence of errors. Uh, in the modern days, we uh, just showing the errors, all of this, sometimes it's not really too um, accurate or meaningful. So we need to have some kind of level of acceptance. Uh, acceptance. We need to say that within certain scope, what is our goal? What is our you know, uh, successful rate or failure rate? A basic example would be, let's say you write a program that generates a lot of you know, uh, prime numbers. As we know that the prime numbers are unlimited because the, the integers are unlimited. So you can never claim that your software, your, your algorithm of generating a prime algorithm is 100% is correct, even though you're very confident this is correct. But you cannot really claim that because you never can run the test against every single prime number because numbers are unlimited. But what we can claim is that my algorithm works perfectly for all the prime numbers from within one to 100 or within one to 100,000. That's something you can do. So nowadays when we're talking about testing, now you really need to think about the scope, right? So under what kind of a context and what kind of goals I want to reach. Another very common example you see these days is this kind of availability numbers. So for example, you've signed up some services as a Gmail or you sign up, um, you know, Blackboard, you, you sign up, um, you use some cloud servers. If you look at their agreement, they will say something about availability. They will say something 99%, 99.5, 99.999. 9. So this one means that they will make sure that their service, mostly online, will be available and ready to use without errors uh, at that percent of time per year. So if you're talking about 90%, 99% of the time per year, that means there will be 1% of the time a year uh, that might have some kind of downtime that you cannot use the service for a different reason. Maybe they need to do some kind of a regular maintenance. Maybe they need to do, um, they have bugs to fix. They maybe have some other things unexpected. Right. So that one person actually counts for three days, as you can see here. That's why uh, some of the services will give you 99.99999. You might be wondering what's the, what's the difference, why you care about that digit. Well, because that digit matters a lot for the year. If you're talking about 99.99, uh, uh, that has uh, almost one hour downtime. But if you're talking about 99.999, just one more nine, and you only have five minutes downtime. 
as you can see, when you are having this kind of um, you know requirements, uh, that really puts a lot of um, a high, very high bar for the services to be up all the time. All right, so this is called a service level agreement. So next time when you see this one, you can see that this one tells their confidence and their goal of making sure how services are running correctly. And then some of the more popular um, uh, kind of a approach people are using about the testing is uh, is quite different from the past. And they did when people are talking about testing, especially under the context of um, IDO development, is that we want all the engineers and developers to be testers. And we also want them to all have a mindset that as you do the coding, you should always think about testing. And then some of the popular software development approach, one of them is called test-driven development. Now this one even put the testing into a, a more important stage. So every time we start writing a code, you actually start to write a fitting test first, and then you make your code to pass. So we'll show this example at one point, but this totally changed people's mind about how testing works because traditionally we write the code first and then we write test and they this some of the developers, some of the teams in some of the uh, popular startups, they actually will write a test first and then uh, create a code to, to satisfy that test. So that's a much more than approach of software testing. Now, in terms of a testing message, okay, so we have um, uh, mainly two types. One is called a black box testing, sometimes we call it functional testing. In this case, we're trying to test the input and output. So. I have a, my expectation. I give you this number as the input. I'm expecting to see the output. So I just want to see if the output you gave me is, uh, uh, is as expected. But I don't really care about how you write it internally. I don't want to see the logic. I don't want to see all the code. That's called black box testing. Um, by comparison, you also have the web box testing. So in this case, that we want to see how you implement the internal box. You know, what's your code, what's the logic, what the library you're using. By understanding the code, I can design some better and more effective test cases just to fit certain branches, certain logic, and certain details. For example, there's a if else statement. And I, well, I want to make sure that I can test both either case. So by looking at the code, by looking at the condition, I can design two different sets of inputs to trigger the different branches so that we can see if the results are correct. So in order to do that, you have to understand the code and that's called uh, white box testing. Um, but you know, both approach are, are good and a lot of people feel that the black box uh, testing is better because that's our goal, right? We don't really need to care about the internal logic and that is true. However, there is a feasibility about black box testing because most of the cases you cannot test all the possible inputs. The example I mentioned earlier was the prime number generator, right? So you can test it with all the input and output to give you a number and then you tell me true or false, whether it's a prime number or not. And I can give you a lot of numbers, but I can never test every single number because the numbers are unlimited. Even if it is limited, but you know, there might be too many combinations and possibilities. If your parameter, your function takes four parameters and then every parameter has, you know, different choices. Uh, sorry, 20 parameters and every parameter has four choices, then the total combination added together will be overwhelming. You cannot really finish that. So that's why, um, well, black box testing is good and effective, but it is not always feasible. Um, so that's why we always need to have the web box testing. Now, web box testing is, is very nice because you can efficiently design a test case to fit the code. Like in this case, I got this um, little code here to check if the numbers are equal or not. And then this is my implementation. So if x plus y plus z divide by three, if the average equals to the first number x, and then I'm thinking they're equal. Otherwise, they're not equal. So obviously this is the wrong implementation. That's not how you compare if all the numbers are equal or not. But uh, when I'm writing the test, for example, I get the first tag, which is one, two, and three, right? So I, I send this one over to the function. So this one adds this will be six and divide by three is two. Two does not equal to X, which is one. So that's why we go to here, it says unequal. And that is correct because these numbers are not equal to each other. 
Next time I try xyz all equal to be 2 and I send it here again, the result is 2 and 2 equals to 2. So we print xyz are equal. So now I finish the test with two test cases and then test both branches and seem to be all right. But we still did not catch the error because um, that's that's the limitation of whiteboard testing because we're not really testing every single case and then you think you test all the code with all the test cases but that doesn't guarantee a successful testing as you can see either way there are some drawbacks okay so this one you cannot finish all this one you did a test but it does not give you a hundred percent coverage so that's why you need to realize that there's no perfect way for the testing in reality most of the time, we're doing kind of a combination for both whiteboard testing and, and um, whiteboard testing. Especially when we are writing the unit test, we tend to be doing more on the whiteboard testing. But then when we do the uh, you know, integration test and, and, and the higher level test, and then we try to focus more on the blackboard testing. So, so these are some of the background you need to know um, about uh, uh, testing. And the very practical to uh, topic you need to learn from this part of the lecture is how do you write unit tests? And this is really a fundamental technique uh, as a software um, a skill to have as a software engineer. So this is at the lowest level. So you're testing the smallest unit of your code, uh, which is your method. Okay, so most unit test is for specific method. And in other words, almost every single function you write, every single method you write should have a unit test associated with it. And this is something that you never know until you start to work in the big companies. And once you join a company, you start to really realize, well, some of the work and tasks is not really too difficult. It doesn't really involve a lot of uh, complicated logic or some of the things I never learned before. I can, I can pick it up pretty quickly. However, I can guarantee that the most difficult part and challenging part when you just start to work in a company or in a professional team is the requirements of writing all the unit tests for every single line of code you wrote. So once you finish your code change, right before your, you commit your code change to the repository, you must provide a unit test for every single change you made. And that kind of unit test will be reviewed by our peer developers, and if that doesn't satisfy their, their requirements, it will not be allowed to, pass, to push to the repository. And also I can tell you that in the beginning you will find it much more challenging and difficult to write unit tests than writing the actual implementation code. All right, so this is a skill you must have and if you are not good at writing unit tests, it will be very, very difficult um, to proceed your development in the company. And then today we're gonna to show you the example with uh, JUnit, as a Java's uh, unit testing framework. But if you're not using Java, you can find the equivalent G, uh, the unit testing framework for any kind of languages. Two years ago, we did a survey in the uh, graduate course, and then we actually found out every single language, there are 20 plus unit testing framework we, we um, surveyed, and then they all work in the same way for the same purpose. Okay, so it really doesn't matter which language you're using. Try to pick up that unit testing framework and then try to start use that. So there's some of the resources for JUnit, uh, and we're gonna show you some concrete like uh, uh, JUnit actions and then show you uh, how the JUnit works. 